Reconstruction, High Hopes and Shattered Dreams, 1865 to 1877. Individual Choices, Joseph Rainey. On December 12, 1870, Joseph Rainey became the first African-American to serve in the House of Representatives. Rainey had come a long way since he was born into slavery in 1832 in Georgetown, South Carolina. Growing up, he had a relatively privileged life compared to most slaves. His father, also a slave, was a barber, and as the law required, he kept part of what he earned. Rainey's father eventually saved enough to buy freedom for his family. Rainey learned the, uh, the barber, barber's skills from his father, but his trade was interrupted by the Civil War. The Confederate Army put him to work building fortifications, then crewing on a blockade runner, which is a ship that carried goods through the Union Navy's blockade from Bermuda, the closest British port. Rainey and his wife, Susan, managed to escape to Bermuda, where slavery was illegal. There, he resumed his trade as a barber, and Susan opened a dress shop. They saved their earnings and returned to South Carolina at the end of the war with considerable savings. Rainey soon chose to enter Republican politics. He held several party offices and appointed positions before winning election to the state constitutional convention in 1868, to the state legislature in 1870, and later that same year to the U.S. House of Representatives. He was reelected to Congress in 1872 with no opposition. In 1874 and 1876, however, when he ran for reelection, he faced increasing and increasingly violent opposition, even threats to his life, but he won both times. By then, it took courage for a Black man to run for office in many parts of the South. In some places, African-American candidates were assassinated by those seeking to restore white supremacy. In most places, Black candidates and voters faced intimidation or violence. Defeated in 1878 as Reconstruction was collapsing throughout the South, Rainey left office in early 1879. As a member of the House of Representatives, Rainey spoke forcefully in support of the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, and excerpt appears in the individual voices feature at the end of this chapter. The act was intended to use federal authority to end the reign of terror against African Americans that was being carried out by the Klan and similar organizations. He also worked tirelessly for the passage of the Civil Rights Bill and was especially committed to desegregating public schools. In his speech to Congress in support of the bill, he vividly described the widespread segregation in many aspects of Southern life. The bill passed in early 1875, but without provisions on school segregation or equality for segregated schools. Rainey's efforts were not limited to matters affecting African Americans. He also supported legislation to grant amnesty to many former Confederates, seeing it as a balance to the Civil Rights Act, and he opposed efforts to restrict immigration from China. Rainey was not the only African American who escaped to freedom while the war was raging. That experience was repeated time and time again with many variations all across the South. Those many individual decisions were made legal by the Emancipation Proclamation, enforced by the presence of Union armies, and made permanent by the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which outlawed slavery. Like Rainey, African Americans often had their own ideas about what they wanted most from freedom. After four long, bloody years of civil war, Union armies had smashed across the South, leaving wreckage in their wake, shelled buildings, ravaged farms, twisted railroad tracks. Slavery, the dominant economic and social institution in many parts of the South, collapsed. As white Southerners grieved for their dead and were dismayed by their ravaged countryside, many were also deeply troubled by the emancipation or the release from slavery of four million slaves. The end of slavery forced Southerners of both races to develop new social, economic, and political patterns. The years following the war were a time of physical rebuilding throughout the South, but historians use the term reconstruction to refer primarily to the rebuilding of the federal union and to the political, economic, and social changes that came to the South. Reconstruction involved some of the most momentous questions in American history. How was the defeated South to be treated? What was to be the future of the former slaves? Should key decisions be made by the federal government or in state capitals and county courthouses throughout the South? Which branch of government was to establish policies? What would happen to those who had supported the Confederacy? Thousands of voices across the nation proposed very different answers. As the dominant Republicans turned their attention from waging war to reconstructing the Union, they wrote into law and the Constitution new definitions of the Union itself. They also defined the rights of the freed people and the terms on which the South might rejoin the Union and they permanently changed the definition of American citizenship. Most white Southerners disliked the new rules emerging from Washington and some resisted. Disagreement arose over the future of the South and the status of the former slaves led to conflict between the president and Congress. A temporary result of this conflict was a more powerful Congress and a less powerful executive. A lasting outcome of these events was a significant increase in the authority of the federal government and new limits on local and state governments. Reconstruction significantly changed many aspects of Southern life. 
In the end, however, Reconstruction failed to fulfill many African Americans' hopes for their lives as free people. Presidential Reconstruction. Considering the one question, what did Presidents Lincoln and Johnson seek to accomplish for the South? How did white Southerners respond to those efforts? On New Year's Day, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation took effect. At the time, however, the proclamation did not affect any slaves because it abolished slavery only in territory under Confederate control and was therefore unenforceable. But every advance of a Union army after January 1st, 1863 brought emancipation to the slaves of the Confederacy. Remember that the Emancipation Proclamation redefined the war as one that would see the end of slavery. When the war began, it was simply a war to preserve the Union. In 1863, with this, we see the war sort of shift in its meaning. Republican War Aims. For Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party, freedom for the slaves became a central concern partly because abolitionists were influential within the party. During its 1860 electoral campaign, the Republican Party had promised only to prohibit slavery in the territories, and Lincoln initially defined the war as one to maintain the Union. Some leading Republicans, however, wanted to abolish slavery everywhere. As Union troops moved into the South, some slaves simply walked from their owners, walked away from their owners. Many sought safety within the un Union Army. Soon former slaves became Union soldiers as well. Abolitionists throughout the North, including Frederick Douglass, an escaped slave and an important leader of the abolition movement, now argued that emancipation would be meaningless unless the government guaranteed the civil and political rights of the former slaves. Thus, some Republicans expanded their definition of war objectives to include abolishing slavery, extending citizenship for the former slaves, and guaranteeing the equality of all citizens before the law. At the time, these were extreme views on abolition and equal rights, and the people who held them were called radical Republicans or simply radicals. Thaddeus Stevens, 73 years old in 1865, the last year of the Civil War, was the leading radical in the House of Representatives. He had made a successful career as a Pennsylvania lawyer and iron manufacturer before winning election to Congress in 1858. Born with a club foot, he identified with those outside the social mainstream. He became a compelling spokesman for the abolition and an uncompromising advocate of equal rights for African Americans. A masterful parliamentarian, he was known for his honesty, honesty and sarcastic wit. From the beginning of the war, Stevens urged that the slaves not only be freed, but also be armed to fight the Confederacy. By the end of the war, some 180,000 African Americans, the great majority of them freedmen, had served in the Union Army and a few thousand in the Union Navy. Many more worked for the Army as laborers. Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, a prominent radical in the Senate, had argued for racial integration of Massachusetts schools in 1849 and won election to the US Senate in 1851. The Senate's foremost champion of abolition, he suffered a severe beating in 1856 because of an anti-slavery speech. That was the caning of Sumner, if you happen to remember that. After emancipation, Sumner, like Stevens, fought for full political and civil rights for the freed people. Stevens, Sumner, and other radicals opposed slavery both on moral grounds and because they believed free labor was more productive. Slaves worked to escape punishment, they argued, but free workers worked to benefit themselves. Eliminating slavery and instituting a free labor system, they claimed, would benefit everyone by increasing the nation's productivity. In this view, free labor not only contributed centrally to the dynamism of the North's economy, but was also crucial to democracy itself. The middling classes who own the soil and work it with their own hands, Stephen once proclaimed, are the main support of every free government. Not all Republicans agreed with the radicals. All Republicans objected to slavery, but not all Republicans were abolitionists. Similarly, not all Republicans wanted to extend full citizenship rights to the former slaves. Some favored rapid restoration of the South to the Union so that the federal government could concentrate on stimulating the nation's economy and developing the West. Such Republicans are usually referred to as moderates. Lincoln's approach to Reconstruction, quote, with malice toward men. After the Emancipation Proclamation, President Lincoln and the Congressional Radicals agreed that abolition of slavery had to be a condition for the return of the South to the Union. Major differences soon appeared, however, of, over other terms for Union and the roles of the President and Congress in establishing those terms. In his second inaugural address, a month before his death, Lincoln defined the task facing the nation, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Lincoln began to rebuild the union on the basis of these principles. 
As soon as Union armies occupied portions of, the, of southern states, he appointed temporary military governors for those regions and tried to restore civil governments as quickly as possible. Drawing on the president's constitutional power to issue pardons, Lincoln issued a proclamation of amnesty and reconstruction in December of 1863 called the 10% plan. This is very important to note. Apush loves to ask about the 10% plan. It promised a full pardon and restoration of rights to those who swore their loyalty to the union and accepted the abolition of slavery. Only high ranking Confederate leaders were not eligible. Once those who had taken the oath in a state amounted to 10% of the votes cast by that state in the 1860 election, the pardoned voters were to write a new state constitution that abolished slavery, elect state officials, and resume self-government. Some radicals considered Lincoln's approach as 10% plan too lenient. When they tried to set more stringent standards, Lincoln blocked them, fearing their plan would slow restoration of civil government and perhaps lengthen the war. Under Lincoln's 10% plan, new state governments were established in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Tennessee during 1864 and early 1865. In Louisiana, the new government denied voting rights to men who were one quarter or more black. Radicals complained, but Lincoln urged patience, suggesting the reconstructed government in Louisiana was as the egg to the fowl, and we shall sooner have the fowl by hatching the egg than by smashing it. Radicals, however, concluded that freed people were unlikely to receive equitable treatment from state governments formed under the 10% plan. Some moderates agreed and moved toward the radicals' position that only suffrage, or the right to vote, could protect the freedmen's rights and that only federal action could guarantee Black suffrage. Abolishing Slavery Forever, the 13th Amendment. Amid questions about the rights of freed people, congressional Republicans prepared for the final destruction of slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation had been a wartime measure justified partly by military necessity. It never applied to Union states or border states. State legislatures or conventions abolished slavery in West Virginia, Maryland, Missouri, and the reconstructed state of Tennessee. In early 1865, slavery remained legal in Delaware and Kentucky, and pre-war state laws, which might or might not be valid, permitted slavery in the states that had seceded. To destroy slavery forever, Congress in January of 1865 approved the 13th Amendment, which read simply, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. The Constitution requires any amendment to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. Then that number would be 27 out of the 36 states that existed. By December of 1865, only 19 of the 25 Union states had ratified the amendment. The measure passed, however, when eight of the reconstructed Southern states approved it. In the end, therefore, the abolition of slavery hinged on action by reconstructed state governments in the South. Andrew Johnson and Reconstruction. In April 1865, shortly after surrender of the main Confederate army, Lincoln was assassinated by a supporter of the Confederacy, John Wilkes Booth. Vice President Andrew Johnson became president. Johnson had never had an opportunity to attend school and spent his early life struggling against poverty. As a young man in Tennessee, he worked as a tailor, then turned to politics. His wife, Eliza McArdle Johnson, tutored him in reading, writing, and arithmetic. A Democrat, Johnson was elected to Congress and later as governor before winning election to the U.S. Senate in 1857. His political support came primarily from small-scale farmers and working people. The state's elite of plantation owners usually opposed him. Johnson, in turn, resented their wealth and power and blamed them for secession and the Civil War. Johnson was the only Southern senator who rejected the Confederacy. Early in the war, Union forces captured Nashville, the capital of Tennessee, and Lincoln appointed Johnson as military governor. Johnson dealt harshly with Tennessee secessionists, especially wealthy planters. Radical Republicans approved. Johnson was elected vice president in 1864, receiving the nomination in part because Lincoln wanted to appeal to Democrats and Unionists in border states. When Johnson became president, radicals hoped he would join their efforts to transform the South. Johnson, however, was strongly committed to states' rights and opposed the radicals' objective of a powerful federal government. States' rights, by the way, is a political position favoring limitation of the federal government's power and maximum self-government by individual states. And that's an argument that we've been having clear back to the days of Jefferson and Hamilton in the 1790s. Said Johnson, white men alone must manage the South, Johnson announced, although he recommended limited political roles for the freedmen. Self-righteous and uncompromising, Johnson saw the major task of Reconstruction as empowering the region's white middle class and excluding wealthy planters from power. 
Like Lincoln, Johnson relied on the president's constitutional power to grant pardons. He wanted a quick restoration of the Southern states to the Union and granted amnesty to most former Confederates who pledged loyalty to the Union and support for emancipation. In one of his last actions as president, he granted full pardon and amnesty to all Southern rebels. Unlike Lincoln, who exempted high-ranking Confederates from his pardons, although the 14th Amendment, discussed later in this chapter, prevented him from restoring their right to hold office. Johnson appointed provisional civilian governors for the Southern states not already reconstructed. He instructed them to reconstitute, so to remake, state government and to call constitutional conventions of delegates elected by pardoned voters. Some provisional governors, however, appointed former Confederates to state and local offices, outraging those who expected Reconstruction to bring to power loyal Unionists committed to a new Southern society. The Southern response, minimal compliance. Johnson expected the state constitutional conventions to abolish slavery, ratify the 13th Amendment, renounce secession, and repudiate, or which means, uh, by the way, the act of rejecting the validity or authority of something or to refuse to pay, so to repudiate their states as war debts. The states were then to hold elections and resume their places in the Union. State conventions during the summer of 1865 usually complied with these requirements, some grudgingly. Every state, however, rejected Black suffrage. By April 1866, a year after the close of the war, all the Southern states had fulfilled Johnson's requirements for rejoining the Union and had elected legislators, governors, and members of Congress. Johnson had hoped for the emergence of new political leaders in the South, but was dismayed at the number of rich planters and former Confederate officials who won elections. Most white Southerners, however, viewed Johnson as their protector, standing between them and their radicals. His support for states' rights and his opposition to federal determination of voting rights led white Southerners to expect that they would shape the transition from slavery to freedom, that they, and not Congress, would define the status of the former slaves. To skip back to In the Wider World, Abolition of Slavery Around the World on page 374. By abolishing slavery, the United States followed the lead of most of the nations of Europe and Latin America. Slavery had existed throughout human history, but in the 18th century, Enlightenment thinkers began to criticize slavery as violating human rights. At the same time, some religious groups, notably the Quakers, began to work for abolition. The following list summarizes general patterns in the abolition of slavery around the world. Space does not permit listing all nations. Though illegal, chattel slavery still exists in parts of Africa and the Middle East, notably Mauritania and Sudan. In other places, people work in conditions approaching slavery through forced prostitution, debt bondage, and forced labor camps. Take a moment and review the list that you see there on 374. This ranges from 1587, where the slave trade is abolished in Japan, 1808, when the U.S. prohibits importation of slaves, 1865, when the 13th Amendment prohibited slavery here in the U.S., all the way through 1962, when slavery was abolished in Saudi Arabia. Freedom and the legacy of slavery. Considering the two questions, what seemed to have been the leading objectives among freed people as they explored their new opportunities? And how do the differing responses of freed people and Southern whites show different understandings of the significance of emancipation? As state conventions wrote new constitutions, African-Americans throughout the South set about creating new free lives for themselves. In the antebellum or pre-Civil War South, all slaves and most free African-Americans have le had led lives tightly constrained by law and custom. They were permitted few social organizations of their own. Not surprisingly, the central theme of the Black response to emancipation was a desire for freedom from white control, for autonomy, meaning control of one's own affairs, as individuals and as a community. The prospect of autonomy touched every aspect of life, family, churches, schools, newspapers, and a host of other social institutions. From this ferment of freedom came new Black institutions that provided the basis for Southern African-American communities. At the same time, the economic life of the South had been shattered by the Civil War and was being transformed by emancipation. Thus, white Southerners also faced drastic economic and social change. Defining the meaning of freedom. At the most basic level, freedom came every time in an individual slave stopped working for a master and claimed the right to be free. Thus, freedom did not come to all slaves at the same time or in the same way. For some, freedom came before the Emancipation Proclamation when they walked away from their owners, crossed into Union-held territory, and asserted their liberty. Toward the end of the war, as civil authority broke down throughout much of the South, many slaves declared their freedom and left the site of their bondage. Some left for good, but many re remained nearby, though with a new understanding of their relationship to their former masters. For some, freedom did not come until ratification of the 13th Amendment. Across the South, the approach of Yankee troops set off a joyous celebration called the Jubilee among those who knew their enslavement was ending. 
As one Virginia woman remembered, such rejoicing and shouting you never heard in your life. Once the celebrating was over, however, the freed people had to decide how best to use their freedom. The freed people expressed their new status in many ways. Some chose new names to symbolize their new beginning. Many freed people changed their style of dress, discarding the cheap clothing provided to slaves. Some acquired guns. A significant benefit of freedom was the ability to travel without a pass and without being checked by the patrollers who had enforced the pass system. The pass system, by the way, were laws that forbade slaves to travel without written authorization from their owners. Many freed people took this new opportunity to travel. Some felt they had to leave the site of their enslavement to experience full freedom. One freed man later recalled that he refused to work for his last owner, not because he had anything against him, but because he wanted to, quote, take my freedom. A freed woman said, if I stay here, I'll never know I'm free. Most traveled only short distances to find work or land to farm, to seek family members separated from them by slavery, or for other well-defined reasons. The towns and cities of the South attracted some freed people. The presence of Union troops and federal officials promised protections from the random violence against freed people that occurred in rural areas. In March of 1865, Congress created the Freedmen's Bureau to assist the freed people in their transition to freedom. In cities and towns, this agency, the Freedmen's Bureau, offered assistance to finding, with finding work and necessities. Cities and towns also held black churches, newly established schools, and other social institutions, some begun by free blacks before the war. Some African Americans came to towns and cities looking for work. Little housing was available, however, so freed people often crowded into hastily built shanties. Sanitation was poor and disease a common scourge. Such conditions improved only very slowly. Creating communities. During Reconstruction, African Americans created their own communities with their own social institutions, beginning with family ties. Joyful families were sometimes reunited after years of separation caused by the sale of a spouse or children. Other people spent years searching for lost family members. The new freedom to conduct religious services without white supervision was especially important. Churches quickly became the most prominent social organizations in African American communities. Churches were, in fact, among the very first social institutions that African Americans fully controlled. During Reconstruction, Black denominations grew rapidly in the South, including the African Methodist Episcopal, the AME Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Zion, and several Baptist groups, all founded before the Civil War. Black ministers helped congregation members adjust to the changes that freedom brought, and ministers often became key leaders within developing African American communities. Throughout the cities and towns of the South, African Americans created schools. Setting up a school, said one, was the first proof of independence. Many new schools were for both children and adults because laws had prohibited education for slaves. The desire to learn was widespread and intense. One freedman in Georgia wrote to a friend, the Lord has sent books and teachers. We must not hesitate a moment, but go on and learn all we can. When African-Americans set up schools, they faced severe shortages of teachers, books, and schoolrooms, everything but students. As abolitionists and Northern reformers tried to assist the transition from slavery to freedom, many of them also focused on education. The Freedmen's Bureau played an important role in organizing and equipping schools. Freedmen's Aid Societies sprang up in most Northern cities and along with Northern churches collected funds and supplies for the freed people. Teachers, mostly white women, often from New England and often acting on religious impulses came from the North. Northern Aid Societies and church organizations together with the Freedmen's Bureau established schools to train black teachers. Some of those schools evolved into black colleges. By 1870, the Freedmen's Bureau supervised more than 4,000 schools with more than 9,000 teachers and 247,000 students. Still in 1870, only one-tenth of school-age Black children were in school. African Americans created other social institutions in addition to churches and schools, including fraternal orders, benevolent societies, and newspapers. Fraternal orders, by the way, are men's organizations, often with ceremonial initiations that typically provided rudimentary life insurance, and benevolent societies are organizations dedicated to some charitable purpose. By 1866, the South had 10 Black newspapers led by the New Orleans Tribune. These newspapers played important roles in shaping African-American communities. In politics, African-Americans' first objective was recognition of their equal rights as citizens. Frederick Douglass insisted, slavery is not abolished until the Black man has the ballot. In 1865, Political conventions of African Americans attracted hundreds of leaders of the emerging Black communities. They called for equality and voting rights, and they pointed to Black contributions in the American Revolution and the Civil War as evidence of patriotism and devotion. They also appealed to the nation's Republican traditions, in particular the Declaration of Independence and its dictum that all men are created equal. Land and labor in the post-war South. Few white Southerners welcomed the end of slavery. 
Only a few former slave owners provided financial assistance to their former slaves, and some tried to keep their slaves from learning of their freedom. Many freed people looked to Union troops for assistance. When General William T. Sherman led his victorious army through Georgia in the closing months of the war, thousands of African-American men, women, and children claimed their freedom and followed in the Yankees' wake. Their leaders told Sherman that they wanted to, quote, reap the fruit of our own labor. In January of 1865, Sherman issued Special Field Order Number 15, setting aside the sea islands and land along the South Carolina coast for freed families. Each family, he specified, was to receive 40 acres and the loan of an army mule. You've probably heard the phrase 40 acres and a mule before. Here's where that comes from. By June, the area had filled with 40,000 freed people settled on 400,000 acres of, quote, Sherman land. Sherman's action encouraged African Americans to expect that the federal government would redistribute land throughout the South. 40 acres and a mule became a rallying cry. Only land, Thaddeus Stevens proclaimed, would give freed people control of their own labor. If we do not furnish them with homesteads, Stevens said, we had better left them in bondage. By the end of the war, the Freedmen's Bureau controlled some 850,000 acres of land abandoned by former owners or confiscated from Confederate leaders. In July of 1865, General Oliver O. Howard, head of the Bureau, directed that this land be divided into 40 acre plots to, begin, to be given to freed people. However, President Johnson ordered Howard to halt land redistribution and return to its former owners land that had already been handed over. Johnson's order displaced thousands of African Americans who had already taken their 40 acres. Those who had expected land of their own felt betrayed. One later recalled that they had expected a heap of freedom they didn't get. The Freedmen's Bureau also assisted white refugees. In a few places, white recipients of aid outnumbered the freed blacks. Most Southern whites had never owned slaves and now they feared they would have to compete with the freed people for farmland or wage labor. Like the freed people, many Southern whites lacked the means to farm on their own. When the Confederate government collapsed, Confederate money became worthless. This sudden reduction in the amount of money in circulation, together with the failure of Southern banks and the devastation of the Southern economy, meant that the entire region was short of capital. Capital, by the way, is money, especially the money invested in a commercial enterprise. Sharecropping, which is a system for renting farmland in which tenant farmers or sharecroppers give landlords a share of their crops rather than cash to pay their rent. Um, sharecropping slowly emerged across much of the South, derived from the central realities of Southern agriculture. Much of the land, the land was in large land holdings, but the landowners had no one to work in. Because capital was scarce, many landowners lacked cash to hire farm workers. Many families, both black and white, wanted their own farm but had no land, no supplies, and no money. Under sharecropping, an individual, usually a family head, signed a contract with the landowner to rent land as home and farm, paying a share of the harvest as rent. The landlord's share might amount to half or more of the crop if the landlord provided mules, tools, seed, and fertilizer, as well as land. Many landowners thought that sharecropping encouraged tenants to be productive, to get as much value as possible from their shares of the crop. Southern farmers, black or white sharecroppers or owners of small plots, often found themselves in debt to a local merchant who advanced supplies on credit. In return for credit, the merchant required a lien, which is a legal claim, on the growing crop. Many landlords ran stores that they required their tenants to patronize. Often, the share paid as rent and the debt owed to the store exceeded the value of the entire harvest. Furthermore, many rental contracts and crop lands were automatically renewed if all debts were not paid at the end of a year. Thus, in spite of their efforts to achieve greater control over their lives and labor, many Southern families, black and white alike, found themselves trapped by sharecropping and debt. Still, sharecropping gave freed people more control over their daily lives than had slavery. And of course, now people cannot be bought and sold, which is a major distinction, but sharecropping is still not gonna be a happy situation. Landlords could exercise political as well as economic power over their tenants. Until the 1890s, voting was an open process and any observer could see how an individual voted. Can you believe that? Thus, when a landlord or merchant advocated a particular candidate, the unspoken message was often an implicit threat to cut off credit at the store or to evict a sharecropper if he did not vote accordingly. Such forms of economic coercion could undercut voting rights. The White South Confronting Change. The Civil War and the end of slavery transformed the lives of white Southerners as well as black Southerners. For some, the changes were nearly as profound as those experienced by freed people. Savings vanished. Some homes and other buildings were destroyed. Thousands left the South. Before the war, few white Southerners had owned slaves and very few owned large numbers. Distrust or even hostility had always existed between the privileged planter families and the many whites who farmed small plots. 
Some regions populated by small scale farmers had resisted secession and some welcomed the union victory and supported the Republicans during reconstruction. Some Southerners also welcomed the prospect of the economic transformation that Northern capital might bring. Most white Southerners, however, shared what one North Carolinian described in 1866 as, quote, the bitterest hatred toward the North. Even people with no attachment to slavery detested the Yankees who so profoundly changed their lives. During the early phases of Reconstruction, most white Southerners apparently expected that, except for slavery, things would soon be put back much as they had before the war. For many, the, quote, lost cause of the Confederacy came to symbolize their defense of their pre-war lives, not an attempt to break up the nation or to protect slavery. In late 1865 and 1866, the newly organized state legislatures passed Black Codes, which defined the new legal status of African Americans. Black Codes, by the way, are laws passed by Southern states after the Civil War, limiting the civil rights of freed people and defining their status as subordinate to whites. These regulations varied from state to state, but every state placed significant restrictions on Black people. Various Black Codes required African Americans to have an annual employment contract, limited them to agricultural work, forbade them from moving about the countryside without permission, restricted their ownership of land, and provided for forced labor by those guilty of vagrancy. Vagrancy, by the way, is a legal condition of having no fixed place of residence or means of support. So if you don't have a stable home or a stable job, if you're found guilty of vagrancy, this usually meant anybody without a job. Taken together, the Black Codes represented an effort by white Southerners to define a legally subordinate place for African Americans and to significantly restrict their new freedom. The South is attempting to replicate elements of slavery with Black Codes. Some white Southerners used violence to coerce freed people into accepting a subordinate status. Violence and terror became closely associated with the Ku Klux Klan, a secret organization formed in 1866 and led by a former Confederate general. The turn to terror suggests that Klan members felt themselves largely powerless through normal politics, and they used terror to create a climate of fear among their opponents. Most Klan members were small-scale farmers and workers, but the leaders were often prominent within their own communities. One Freedmen's Bureau agent observed, the most respectable citizens are engaged in it. Klan groups existed throughout the South, but they operated with little central control. Their major goals were to restore white supremacy and to destroy the Republican Party. Other like-minded organizations also formed and adopted similar tactics. Klan members were called ghouls. Officers included Cyclops, Nighthawks, and Grand Dragons, and the national leader was called the Grand Wizard. Klan members covered their faces with hoods, wore white robes, and rode horses draped in white as they set out to intimidate Black Republicans and their white allies. Klan members also attacked less politically prominent people, whipping African Americans accused of not showing sufficient deference to whites, and night riders burned black churches and schools. By such tactics, the Klan devastated Republican organizations in many communities. Congressional Reconstruction, considering the two questions, why did congressional Republicans take control over reconstruction policy? How successful were they? And how did the 14th and 15th amendments change the future or the nature, excuse me, of the federal union? The Black Codes, violence against freed people, and the failure of Southern authorities to stem the violence turned Northern opinion against President Johnson's lenient approach to Reconstruction. Increasing numbers of moderate Republicans accepted the radicals' arguments that the freed people required greater federal protection, and congressional Republicans moved to take control of Reconstruction. When stubborn and uncompromising Andrew Johnson ran up against stubborn and uncompromising Thaddeus Stevens, the nation faced a constitutional crisis. Challenging Presidential Reconstruction, the Civil Rights Act of 1866. In December of 1865, the 39th Congress elected in 1864 met for the first time. Republicans outnumber, outnumber Democrats by more than three to one. President Johnson proclaimed Reconstruction complete and the Union restored, but few Republicans agreed. Events in the South had convinced most moderate Republicans of the need to protect free labor in the South and to establish basic rights for freed people. Most also agreed that Congress could withhold representation from the South until reconstructed state governments met those conditions. On the first day of the 39th Congress, moderate Republicans joined radicals to exclude newly elected congressmen from the South. Citing Article I, Section 5 of the Constitution, which makes each House of Congress the judge of the qualifications of its members, Republicans set up a joint committee on reconstruction to evaluate whether electees from Southern states were entitled to sit in Congress. In the meantime, the former Confederate states had no representation in Congress. Congressional Republicans also moved to provide more assistance to the freed people. Moderates and radicals approved a bill extending the Freedmen's Bureau and giving it more authority against racial discrimination. When Johnson vetoed it, Congress passed a slightly revised version. Republicans also produced a civil rights bill, a far-reaching measure extending citizenship to African Americans and guaranteeing certain rights to all citizens. 
Johnson vetoed both the Civil Rights Bill and the revised Freedmen's Bureau Bill, but Congress passed both over his veto. With creation of the Joint Committee on Reconstruction and the passage of the Civil Rights and the Freedmen's Bureau Acts, Congress took control of Reconstruction. For the first time, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 defined all persons born in the United States, except Indians not taxed, as citizens, thereby directly challenging the Supreme Court's ruling in the Dred Scott case, and listed certain rights of all citizens, including the right to testify in court, own property, make contracts, bring lawsuits, and enjoy full and equal benefits of all laws. It restricted state authority on the grounds that the rights of national citizenship took precedence over state actions, meaning that national citizenship is more important than what a state might do. The law expanded federal powers in unprecedented ways and challenged traditional concepts of states' as rights. Though the law applied to all citizens, its most immediate consequence was to benefit African Americans. Debate in Congress focused on the freed people. Some supporters saw the Civil Rights Act as a way to secure freed peoples' as basic rights. For other Republicans, the bill carried broader implications because it empowered the federal government to force states to abide by the principle of equality before the law. They applauded its redefinition of federal state relations. Senator Lott Mill of Maine described it as an absolutely revolutionary, but added, are we not in the midst of a revolution? When President Johnson vetoed the bill, he argued that it violated states' rights. He may have hoped to generate enough political support to elect a conservative Congress in 1866 and to win the presidency in 1868. He probably expected his veto to turn voters against the radicals. Instead, the veto led most moderate Republicans to abandon any hope of cooperating with him. In April of 1866, when Congress passed the Civil Rights Act over Johnson's veto, it was the first time that Congress had overridden a presidential veto of major legislation. Defining citizenship, the 14th Amendment. Listen very carefully, the 14th Amendment is very, very important for you to understand. Leading Republicans worried that the Civil Rights Act would be, could be amended or repealed by a later Congress or declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Only a constitutional amendment, they concluded, could permanently safeguard the freed people's rights as citizens. The 14th Amendment began as a radical proposal for a constitutional guarantee of equality before the law. However, the final wording, the longest of any amendment, resulted from many compromises. Section 1 of the amendment defined American citizenship in much the same way as the Civil Rights Act of 1866. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. The phrase subject to the jurisdiction thereof excluded only diplomats from other countries who had diplomatic immunity for most US laws and those Native Americans who were not taxed by state or federal governments since everyone else living in the US was subject to federal and state law. The amendment then specified, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the US, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The Constitution and Bill of Rights prohibit federal interference with basic civil rights. The 14th Amendment extends this protection against action by state governments. The amendment was vague on some points. For example, it penalized states that did not enfranchise or provide the vote to uh, African Americans by reducing their congressional representation, but it did not specifically guarantee to African Americans the right to vote. Not everyone approved of the final wording. Charles Sumner condemned the provision that permitted a state to deny suffrage to male citizens if it accepted a penalty. Women suffrage advocates led by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony complained that the amendment for the first time introduced the word male into the constitution in connection with voting rights. Despite such concerns, Congress approved the 14th amendment by a straight party vote and sent it to the states for ratification. Tennessee promptly ratified the amendment, became the first reconstructed state government to be recognized by Congress and was exempted from most later reconstruction legislation. Although Congress adjourned in the summer of 1866, the nation's attention remained fixed on Reconstruction. In May and July, in Memphis and New Orleans, bloody riots aimed at African Americans turned more moderates against Johnson's Reconstruction policies. Some interpreted congressional elections that fall that fall as a referendum on Reconstruction and the 14th Amendment, pitting Johnson against the radicals. Republicans swept the 1866 elections, outnumbering Democrats 143 to 49 in the new House of Representatives and outnumbering them 42 to 11 in the Senate. Lyman Trumbull, senator from Illinois and a leading moderate, voiced the consensus of congressional Republicans. Congress should now hurl from power the disloyal element in the South. It matters today, the 14th Amendment. 
The 14th Amendment is one of the most important sources of Americans' civil rights, next to the Bill of Rights, which is the first 10 amendments. One key provision in the 14th Amendment is the definition of American citizenship. Previously, the Constitution did not address that question. The 14th Amendment cleared up any confusion about who was and who was not a citizen. In recent years, however, a number of political conservatives have challenged the concept of birthright citizenship, that is, the granting of citizenship to anybody born in the U.S. The amendment also specifies that no state could abridge or to cut short the liberties of a citizen without due process of law. Until this time, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights restricted action by the federal government to restrict individual liberties. The Supreme Court has interpreted the 14th Amendment to mean that the restrictions placed on the federal government by the First Amendment also limit state governments, that no state government may abridge or cut short freedom of speech, press, assembly, religion. The Supreme Court continues to interpret the 14th Amendment when it is presented with new cases involving state restrictions on the rights of citizens. For example, in Roe v. Wade 1973, the Supreme Court cited the Due Process Clause among other provisions of the Constitution to conclude that state laws may not prevent women from having abortions. In Lawrence v. Texas 2003, the court cited the 14th Amendment to conclude that states may not punish adults for engaging in consensual sexual activities. The court's decision in Obergefell v. Hodges 2015, invalidating state laws prohibiting same-sex marriage, was also based on the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. If you want, you can look up the 14th Amendment in the back of this book. Consider how does the 14th Amendment define citizenship? Using an online newspaper, can you find recent proposals to change the definition of American citizenship? And next, what current political issues might lead to court cases in which the 14th Amendment is likely to be invoked? Radicals in control. As congressional radicals struggled with the President Johnson over control of Reconstruction, it became clear that the 14th Amendment might fall short of ratification. Rejection by 10 states could prevent its acceptance. By March of 1867, the amendment had been rejected by 12 states, Delaware, Kentucky, and all former Confederate states except Tennessee. Moderate Republicans who had expected the 14th Amendment to be the final Reconstruction measure now became receptive to other proposals by the radicals. On March 2, 1867, Congress override, overrode Johnson's veto of the Military Reconstruction Act, which divided the Confederate states except Tennessee into five military districts. Each district was to be governed by a military commander authorized by Congress to use military force to protect life and property. These 10 states were to elect delegates and hold constitutional conventions, and all adult male citizens were to vote except former Confederates who were barred from office under the proposed 14th Amendment. The constitutional conventions were then to create new state governments that permitted Black suffrage, and the new governments were to ratify the 14th Amendment. Congress would then evaluate whether those state governments were ready to regain representation in Congress. Congress had wrested a major degree of control over Reconstruction from the president, but it was not finished. The Command of the Army Act specified that the president could issue military orders only through the General of the Army, Ulysses S. Grant, considered an ally of Congress, and that the General of the Army could not be removed without Senate permission. Congress thereby blocked Johnson from direct communication with military commanders in the South. The Tenure of Office Act specified that officials appointed with the Senate's consent were to remain in office until the Senate approved a successor, thereby preventing Johnson from removing federal officials who just opposed his policies. Johnson understood both measures as invasions of presidential authority. Early in 1867, some radicals began to consider impeaching President Johnson. The Constitution gives the House of Representatives exclusive power to impeach the president. That is, to charge the chief executive with misconduct. Remember that to impeach is to charge a public official with improper, usually criminal conduct. Impeachment does not automatically mean removal from office. The Constitution specifies that the Senate shall hold a trial on those charges with the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court presiding. If found guilty by a two-thirds vote of the Senate, the president is removed from office. When Johnson directly challenged Congress over the Tenure of Office Act by removing Edwin Stanton as Secretary of War, Johnson's opponents claimed he had violated the law. When the House Judiciary Committee failed to bring impeachment charges, the Joint Committee on Reconstruction, led by Thaddeus Stevens, took over. On February 24, 1868, the House ad adopted 11 articles or charges nearly all based on the Stanton affair. The actual reasons the radicals wanted Johnson removed were clear to all, though. They disliked him and his actions, and here they have an excuse to finally get him out of office. He did break the law, of course, but their main motivation for, um, for removal and for impeachment, it's not just because of this one law. There's a lot of backstory and a lot of previous drama as well. To convict Johnson and remove him from the presidency required a two-thirds vote by the Senate. Johnson's defenders argued that he had done nothing to warrant impeachment. 
The radicals' legal case was weak, but they urged senators to vote on whether they wished Johnson to remain as president. Some moderates, fearing the precedent of removing a president for such flimsy reasons, joined with Democrats to defeat the radicals. The vote was 35 in favor of conviction and 19 against, one vote short of the required two-thirds to remove him from office. By this tiny margin, Congress endorsed the principle that it should not remove the president from office simply because members of Congress disagree with or dislike the president. Political terrorism and the election of 1868. The radicals' failure to unseat Johnson left him with less than a year remaining in office. As the election approached, the Republicans nominated Ulysses S. Grant for president. A war hero popular throughout the North, Grant committed himself to the congressional view of Reconstruction. The Democrats nominated Horatio Seymour, a former governor of New York, and denounced Reconstruction. In the South, the campaign stirred up fierce activity by the Ku Klux Klan and similar groups. Terrorists assassinated an Arkansas congressman, three members of the South Carolina legislature, and several other Republican leaders. Throughout the South, mobs attacked Republican offices and meetings and sometimes attacked any Black person they could find. Such coercion had its intended effect at the ballot box. Despite such violence in the South, Many Americans may have anticipated a calmer political future. In June of 1868, Congress had readmitted seven Southern states that met the requirements of congressional reconstruction. In July, the Secretary of State declared the 14th Amendment ratified. In November, Grant easily won the presidency, carrying 26 of the 34 states and 53% of the vote. Voting rights and civil rights. With Grant in the White House, radical Republicans moved to secure voting rights for all African Americans. The states still defined voting rights. Congress had required Southern states to enfranchise or to give the vote to black males as the price of readmission to the union, but only seven Northern states had taken that step. Further, any state that had enfranchised African-Americans could change its laws at any time. In addition to the principled arguments of Douglas and other radicals, many Republicans concluded that they needed to guarantee black suffrage in the South if they were to continue to win presidential elections and enjoy majorities in Congress. To secure suffrage rights for all African Americans, Congress approved the 15th Amendment in February of 1869, and that should read African American males. The amendment prohibited both federal and state governments from restricting the right to vote because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Like the 14th Amendment, the 15th marked a compromise between moderates and radicals. Some African American leaders argued for language guaranteeing voting rights to all male citizens because prohibiting some grounds for disenfranchisement might imply the legitimacy of other grounds. Some radicals tried unsuccessfully to add nativity, property, education, or religious beliefs to the prohibited grounds. Nativity, by the way, uh, means place of birth. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and, uh, excuse me, Democrats condemned the 15th Amendment as a revolutionary attack on states' authority to define voting rights. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and other advocates of women's suffrage opposed the amendment because it ignored re uh, restrictions based on sex. For nearly 20 years, efforts to secure women's rights and Black rights had marched together. Once Black male suffrage came under discussion, however, this alliance began to fracture. The break was eventually papered over, but the wounds never completely healed. Despite such opposition, within 13 months, the proposed amendment received the approval of enough states to take effect. Success came in part because Republicans, who might otherwise have been reluctant to impose Black suffrage in the North, concluded that the future success of their party required Black suffrage in the South. The 15th Amendment did not reduce the violence, especially at election time, that had become almost routine in the South. When Klan activity escalated in the elections of 1870, Southern Republicans looked to Washington for support. In 1870 and 1871, Congress adopted several enforcement acts, often called the Ku Klux Klan Acts, to enforce the 14th and 15th Amendments. Despite obstacles, the prosecution of Klansmen began in 1871. Across the South, hundreds were indicted and many were convicted. In South Carolina, President Grant declared martial law. By 1872, federal intervention had broken much of the strength of the Klan. Congress passed one final Reconstruction measure. Charles Sumner introduced a bill prohibiting discrimination in 1870 and in each subsequent session of Congress until his death in 1874. On his deathbed, Sumner urged his visitors to take care of the Civil Rights Bill, begging them don't let it fail. Approved after Sumner's death, the Civil Rights Act of 1875 prohibited racial discrimination in the selection of juries and in public transportation and public accommodations. Skipping back to toward a more perfect union, constitutional revolution. Senator Lottmill described what they were doing as revolutionary and historians have agreed that the constitutional changes of the Civil War and Reconstruction were a constitutional revolution or even the second American revolution. 
Before the Civil War, some Americans had argued that the Union was voluntary and states could secede or nullify federal laws. Now it is clear that the United States was one nation indivisible and that secession constituted insurrection and would be met by force. Defenders of slavery had long argued that Congress had no constitutional authority to limit, much less abolish, slavery. The 13th Amendment changed that forever. Previously, states had their own definitions of citizenship and the Dred Scott decision of the US Supreme Court in 1857 had stated that African Americans could not be citizens. The 14th Amendment now defined an American citizenship that took precedence over state definitions and significantly limited state authority. The 15th Amendment similarly limited state authority over voter eligibility. Overall, the constitutional revolution of the Civil War and Reconstruction significantly enhanced federal authority at the expense of the states. Black Reconstruction, considering the two questions, what major groups made up the Republican Party in the South during Reconstruction? Compare the reasons for being Republicans, their relative sizes, and their objectives. And what were the most lasting results of the Republican state administrations? Congressional Reconstruction set the stage for new developments at state and local levels throughout the South. African Americans never completely controlled any state government, but did form a significant element in the government of several states. The time when African Americans participated prominently in state and local politics is usually called Black Reconstruction. It began with efforts by African Americans to take part in politics as early as 1865 and lasted for more than a decade. A few African Americans continued to hold elective office in the South after 1877, but by then they could do little to bring about significant political change. Map 15.1 indicates the proportion of African Americans in each of the southern states and also the years when each state was under a Reconstruction state government. The Republican Party in the South. Nearly all African Americans who participated in politics did so as Republicans and they formed the majority of the Republican Party in the South. Nearly all Black Republicans were new to politics and they often braved considerable personal danger by participating in a party that many white Southerners equated with the conquering Yankees. Suffrage made politics centrally important for African American communities. The state constitutional conventions that met in 1868 included 265 Black delegates, but only in Louisiana and South Carolina were half or more of the delegates Black. With suffrage established, Southern Republicans began to elect African Americans to public office. Between 1869 and 1877, 14 Black men, including Joseph Rainey, served in the National House of Representatives, and Mississippi sent two African Americans to the U.S. Senate. Across the South, six African Americans served as lieutenant governors, and one of them, PBS Pinchback, succeeded briefly to the governorship of Louisiana. More than 600 Black men served in Southern state legislatures, but only in South Carolina did African Americans ever have a majority in the state legislature. Elsewhere, they formed part of a Republican majority, but rarely held key legislative positions. Only in South Carolina and Mississippi did legislatures elect Black presiding officers. Although politically inexperienced, most African Americans who held office during Reconstruction had some education. Of the 18 who served in statewide offices, all but three are known to have been born free. PBS Pinchback, for example, was educated in Ohio and served in the army as a captain before entering politics in Louisiana. Most black politicians first achieved prominence through service with the army, but the, the Freedmen's Bureau, the new schools, or the religious and civic organizations of black communities. Republicans gained power in Southern states only by attracting some white voters. These white Republicans are usually remembered by the names fastened on them by their political opponents. They are called carpetbaggers. Again, those are white Republicans in the South. Uh, scalawags, they're also known as sort of derisively, um, or excuse me, the second one. Both groups included idealists who hoped to create a new Southern society, but both also included opportunists expecting to exploit politics for personal gain. Southern Democrats applied the term carpetbagger to Northern Republicans who came to the South after the war, regarding them as second-rate schemers, outsiders with their belongings packed in a cheap carpet bag. In fact, most Northerners who came South were well-educated men and women from middle-class backgrounds. Most men had served in the Union Army and moved South before Blacks could vote. They included lawyers, newspaper editors, and investors in agricultural land, as well as teachers in the new schools or agents of the Freedmen's Bureau. Most hope to transform the South by creating new institutions based on Northern models, especially free labor and free public schools. Few in number, transplanted Northerners nonetheless took leading roles in state constitutional conventions and state legislatures. Some were also prominent advocates of economic modernization. Southern Democrats reserved their greatest contempt for those they called scalawags, slang for someone unscrupulous and worthless. Scalawags were white Southerners who became Republicans. They included many Southern Unionists who had opposed secession and others who thought the Republicans offered the best hope for economic recovery. Scalawags included merchants, artisans, and professionals who favored a modernized South. 
Others were small scale farmers who saw reconstruction as a way to end political domination by the planter owner, plantation owners. The freedmen, white newcomers from the North and white Southerners who made up the Republican party in the South hoped to inject new ideas into that region. They tried to modernize state and local governments and make the post-war South more like the North. They repealed outdated laws and established or expanded schools, hospitals, orphanages, and penitentiaries. Creating public education, fighting discrimination, and building railroads. Free public education was perhaps the most enduring legacy of Black Reconstruction because Reconstruction con constitutions required tax-supported public schools. Implementation, however, was expensive and proceeded slowly. By the mid-1870s, only half of Southern children attended public schools. In creating public schools, Reconstruction state governments faced a central question, would white and black children attend the same schools? Many African Americans favored racially integrated schools. Southern white leaders, including many Southern white Republicans, argued that integration would destroy the fledgling public school system by driving whites away. In the end, no state required school integration. Southern states also created separate black normal schools to train school teachers and colleges. On balance, most Blacks probably agreed with Frederick Douglass that separate schools were infinitely superior to no public education at all. Some found other reasons to accept segregated schools. Separate Black schools gave a larger role to Black parents and they hired Black teachers and Black administrators. Creating and operating two educational systems, one white and one Black, was costly and funds were always limited. Black schools almost always received fewer dollars per student than white schools. Despite their accomplishments, the segregated schools institutionalized discrimination. Reconstruction state governments moved toward protection of equal rights in other areas. Southern Republicans often wrote into their new state constitutions prohibitions against discrimination and protections for civil rights. Some Reconstruction state governments enacted laws guaranteeing equal access to public transportation and public accommodations. Elsewhere, efforts to pass equal access laws foundered on the opposition of Southern white Republicans who often joined Democrats to favor segregation. Such conflicts point, pointed up the internal divisions within the Southern Republican Party. Even when equal access laws were passed, they were often not enforced. Republicans everywhere, North, South, and West, sought to use government authority to encourage economic growth and development. Promoting economic development often meant encouraging railroad construction. In the South, as elsewhere, some state governments granted land to railroads or lent them money or committed the state's credit to underwrite bonds for construction. Sometimes they subsidized railroads without planning adequately or determining whether companies were financially sound. Some projects failed as companies squandered funds without building rail lines at all. During the 1870s, only 7,000 miles of new track were laid in the South compared with 45,000 miles elsewhere in the nation. Even that was a considerable accomplishment for the South given its dismal economic situation. Railroad companies and other corporations sometimes sought favorable treatment by bribing public officials. All too many office holders, South, North, and West, accepted their offers. Given the excessive favoritism that most public officials showed to corporations, revelations and allegations of, corrupt, allegations of corruption became common from New York to Mississippi to California, and those will somewhat be addressed by the Gilded Age and progressivism in period six. Southern politics proved especially ripe for corruption as government responsibilities expanded rapidly and created new opportunities for scoundrels. Too many Reconstruction officials, white and black, saw politics as a way to improve their own finances. One South Carolina legislator bluntly described his attitude toward electing a U.S. Senator, I was pretty hard up and I did not care who the candidate was if I got $200. Corruption was usually nonpartisan, but it seemed more prominent among Republicans because they held the most important offices. The end of Reconstruction. Considering the question, what major factors brought about the end of Reconstruction evaluate their relative significance? From the beginning, most white Southerners resisted the new order that the conquering Yankees imposed on them. Initially, resistance took on the form of black codes and the Klan. Later, some Southern opponents of Reconstruction developed new strategies, but terror remained an important instrument of resistance. The new departure in the 1872 presidential election. By 1869, some leading Southern Democrats had abandoned their resistance to change, deciding instead to accept some Reconstruction measures and African-American suffrage. At the same time, they also tried to secure restoration of political rights for former Confederates. Behind this new departure for Southern Democrats lay the belief that continued resistance would only cause more regional turmoil and prolong federal intervention. New departure, by the way, is the strategy adopted by some leading Southern Democrats of cooperating with some reconstruction measures in the hope of winning compromises that are favorable to their party. Sometimes Southern Democrats supported conservative Republicans for state and local offices instead of members of their own party, hoping to defuse concern in Washington and dilute radical influence in state government. 
This strategy appeared first in Virginia, where William Mahone forged a broad political coalition that accepted black suffrage and in 1869 elected as governor a northern born banker and moderate Republican. Virginia therefore, uh, thereby, excuse me, avoided radical Republican rule. Coalitions of Democrats and moderate Republicans won in Tennessee in 1869 and in Missouri in 1870. Elsewhere, leading Democrats grudgingly accepted black suffrage, but attacked Republicans for raising taxes, increasing state spending, and being corrupt. Such campaigns brought a positive response from many taxpayers because Southern tax rates had risen significantly to support the new schools, railroad subsidies, and other modernizing programs. Several victories by so-called redeemers and the new departure Democrats in the early 1870s also coincided with renewed terrorist activity aimed at Republicans. Redeemers, by the way, are Southern Democrats who hope to bring the Democratic Party back into power and to suppress Black Reconstruction. The worst single incident occurred in 1873. A group of armed freedmen fortified the town of Colfax, Louisiana, to hold off Democrats who were planning to seize the county government. After a three-week siege, well-armed whites overcame the Black defenders and killed 280 African Americans. Leading Democrats rarely endorsed such bloodshed, but they reaped political advantages from it. The new departure movement coincided with a national division within the Republican Party. The liberal Republican movement attacked, attracted moderates, concerned that the radicals had gone too far. Others opposed grants on issues not unrelated to Reconstruction, especially growing evidence of corruption. Horace Greeley, editor of the New York Daily Tribune, won the liberal nomination for president in 1872. An opponent of slavery before the Civil War, Greeley had given strong support to the 14th and 15th Amendments but he had sometimes taken puzzling positions, including a willingness to let the South secede. One political observer described him as honest, but conceited, fussy, and foolish. Greeley had long ripped the Democrats in his newspaper columns, but the Democrats nonetheless nominated him in an effort to defeat Grant. Grant won convincingly, carrying 56% of the vote and winning every Northern state and 10 of the 16 Southern and border states. The Politics of Terror, the Mississippi Plan. By 1872, nearly all Southern whites had abandoned the Republicans and Black Reconstruction had ended in several states. African-Americans, however, maintained their Republican loyalties. As Democrats worked to unite, Black, or, excuse me, unite Southern whites behind their banner of white supremacy, the South polarized politically along racial lines. Elections in 1874 proved disastrous for Republicans. Democrats won more than two thirds of the South seats in the House of Representatives and redeemed several more states. Terrorism against Black Republicans and their remaining white allies played a role in some Democratic victories in 1874. Where the Klan had worn disguises and ridden at night, by 1874, Democrats often formed rifle companies, put on red flannel shirts, and marched and drilled in public. In some areas, armed whites prevented African Americans from voting or terrorized prominent Republicans, especially African American Republicans. Republicans in 1874 lost support in the North because of scandals within the Grant administration and because of a major economic depression that was producing high unemployment. In the 1874 elections, Democrats won control of the House of Representatives for the first time since the 1850s, and they could block any new Reconstruction proposals. During 1875 in Mississippi, political violence reached such levels that the use of terror to overthrow Reconstruction became known as the Mississippi Plan. The Mississippi Plan, by the way, is defined as the use of threats, violence, and lynching by Mississippi Democrats in 1875 to intimidate Republicans and bring the Democratic Party to power. Democratic rifle clubs broke up Republican meetings and attacked Republican leaders. One Black Mississippian described the election as the most violent time we have ever seen. When Mississippi's carpetbagger governor, Adelbert Ames, requested federal help, President Grant declined. Grant feared that the Southern Reconstruction governments had become so discredited that further federal military intervention might endanger the election prospects of Republican candidates in the North. Democrats swept the Mississippi elections, winning four fifths of the state legislature. When the legislature convened and impeached and removed from office Alexander Davis, the black Republican Lieutenant Governor on grounds no more serious than those brought against Andrew Johnson. Facing similar action, Governor Ames resigned and left the state. Ames had foreseen the result during the campaign when he wrote, a revolution has taken place by force of arms. The troubled presidential election of 1876. In 1876, on the centennial of American independence, meaning the 100 year celebration, the nation stumbled through a deeply troubled and potentially disastrous political election. As revelations of corruption in the Grant administration multiplied, both parties sought candidates known for their integrity. The Democrats nominated Samuel J. Tilden, governor of New York, who had fought political corruption in New York City. 
the Republicans selected Rutherford B. Hayes, a Civil War general and governor of Ohio. During the campaign in the South, intimidation of Republicans, both black and white, continued in many places. Early election reports indicated a victory for Tilden. In addition to the border states in the South, he also carried New York, New Jersey, and Indiana. Tilden received 51% of the popular vote versus 48% for Hayes. State Republican officials still controlled the counting and reporting of ballots in South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. Charging voting fraud, Republican election boards in those states rejected enough ballots so that the official count gave Hayes narrow, major, narrow, narrow majorities, sorry about that, and thus a one vote margin of victory in the Electoral College. Crying fraud in return, Democratic officials in those states submitted their own versions of the vote count. Angry Democrats vowed to see Tilden inaugurated by force if necessary. Some Democratic newspapers ran headlines that read, Tilden or war, like they didn't just learn a lesson about trying to declare war. For the first time, Congress faced the problem of disputed electoral votes that could decide the outcome of an election. To resolve the challenges, Congress created a commission of five senators, five representatives, and five Supreme Court justices. The Republicans had a one vote majority on the commission. As commission hearings droned on throughout January and into February 1877, informal discussions took place among leading Republicans and Democrats. The result has been called the Compromise of 1877, and this is very important to know because this will be the end of Reconstruction, folks. Again, the Compromise of 1877. This is, by the way, the name applied by historians to discussions around the disputed presidential election of 1876. In the end, Republicans gained the presidency and Southern Democrats received some concessions. Southern Democrats demanded an end to federal intervention in Southern politics, but insisted on federal subsidies for railroad construction and waterways in the South. And they wanted one of their own as postmaster general because that office held the key to most federal patronage. In return, Southern Democrats seemed willing to abandon Tilden's claims to the White House. The Compromise of 1877, however, was never set down in one place or agreed to by all parties. By a straight party vote, the commission confirmed the election of Hayes. Soon after his inauguration, the new president ordered the last of the federal troops withdrawn from the South. The era of a powerful federal government pledged to protect equality before the law for all citizens was over. The last three Republican state governments fell in 1877, giving the Democrats, the party of white supremacy, control in every Southern state. One radical journal bitterly concluded that African Americans had been forced to relinquish the artificial right to vote for the natural right to live. In parts of the South thereafter, election fraud and violence became routine. A Mississippi judge acknowledged in 1890 that, quote, since 1875, we have been preserving the ascendancy of the white people by stuffing ballot boxes, committing perjury, and here and there in the state carrying the elections by fraud and violence. Reconstruction was over. The Civil War was more than 10 years in the past. Many moderate Republicans had hoped that the 14th and 15th Amendments and the Civil Rights Act would guarantee Black rights without a continuing federal presence in the South. Southern Democrats persistently argued on paltry evidence that carpetbaggers and scalawags were all corrupt, that they manipulated Black voters, that African-American office holders were ignorant and illiterate, and that Southern Democrats wanted only honest self-government. The truth of the situation made little difference. Northern Democrats had always deposed Reconstruction and readily adopted the Southern Democrats' version of reality. Such portrayals found growing acceptance among other Northerners too, for many had shown their own racial bias when they resisted Black suffrage and kept their public schools segregated. Remember, just because there's no slavery in the North does not mean that there's no racism or discrimination in the North. In 1875, when Grant refused to use federal troops to protect Black rights, he declared that the whole public are tired out with these outbreaks in the South. He was quoted widely and with approval throughout the North. In addition, a major depression in the mid-1870s, unemployment and labor disputes, the growth of industry, the emergence of a big business, excuse me, of big business, and the development of the West focused the attention of many Americans, including many members of Congress, on economic issues. Basically, people in the North are tired of enforcing Reconstruction in the South, and they're distracted by other things happening elsewhere. Some Republicans, to be certain, kept the faith of their abolitionist and radical forebears and hoped the federal government might again protect Black rights. But though Republicans routinely condemned violations of Black rights after 1877, few Republicans showed much interest in using federal power to prevent such outrages. After Reconstruction. After 1877, Southern Democrats moved to establish new systems of politics and race relations. 
They work to reduce taxes, dismantle reconstruction legislation and agencies, and eliminate meaningful Black participation in politics. They also began the process of turning the South into a one-party region, a situation that reached its fullest development around 1900 and persisted throughout the 1950s. Voting and office holding by African Americans did not cease in 1877, meaning it didn't stop, but without federal enforcement of Black rights, the threat of violence and the potential for economic retaliation by landlords and merchants sharply reduced meaningful political involvement. Efforts to mobilize Black voters posed dangers to candidates and voters, and many Black political leaders concluded that their political survival depended on favors from influential white Republicans or even from Democratic leaders. The public school survived, segregated and underfunded, but nonetheless presenting important opportunities. Many Reconstruction era laws remained on the books, and for a time, many theaters, bars, restaurants, hotels, streetcars, and railroads continued to serve African Americans without discrimination. White supremacy had been established by force of arms, however, and Blacks exercised their rights at the sufferance of the dominant whites. After 1877, Reconstruction was held up as a failure. Although far from accurate, the Southern whites' version of Reconstruction, that conniving carpetbaggers and scalawags had manipulated ignorant freedmen, appealed to many white Americans throughout the nation, and it gained widespread acceptance among many novelists, journalists, and historians. Thomas Dixon's popular novel, The Klansman, 1905, inspired the highly influential film, The Birth of a Nation, 1915. Historically inaccurate and luridly racist, the book and the movie portrayed Klan members as heroes who rescued the white South, and especially white Southern women, from domination and debauchery at the hands of depraved freemen and carpetbaggers. For the response of historians, see a deeper understanding of history feature, which we'll get to here in a moment. Today, we recognize that Reconstruction produced many positive changes both in the South and elsewhere. The creation of public schools was among the most important changes in Southern life produced by the Reconstruction state governments. The 14th and 15th Amendments eventually provided the constitutional leverage to restore the principle of equality before the law that so concerned the radicals. A deeper understanding of history, when historians disagree. The Civil War and Reconstruction, like the American Revolution, form a dividing point in American history, a time when Americans made important and long-lasting choices about their future. Such dividing points attract historians who seek to understand such momentous decisions, but historians don't always agree about the meaning of such important events. When historians approach a research project, they often begin with questions that they seek to answer by examining primary sources. The most typical primary sources are documents, things written by people who participated in or observed the event being studied. Though historians' questions begin with the basic facts, who, what, when, and where, they almost always include the more difficult questions of causation and motivation. Why did events unfold as they did? What motivated individuals and groups to make the decisions they made? While historians tend to agree on the facts, they may disagree on causation and motivation because those questions require judgments about the meaning of documents, the resolution of conflicting sources, and the relative importance of documents. Historians must also decide what weight to give the views of those on differing sides of an issue. For example, how much weight to give to the perspectives of Black leaders of Reconstruction compared to those of their white opponents. Though historians seek to be objective and to understand the past on its own terms, they may unconsciously view the past through the biases and prejudices of their own time. The history of Reconstruction provides examples. After 1877, Southern whites held up Reconstruction as a failure. William A. Dunning endorsed that interpretation in Reconstruction, Political and Economic, 1865 to 1877, published in 1907, and his conclusions dominated the thinking of most white historians for a generation. Early Black historians disagreed. George Washington Williams, a Union Army veteran, had earlier written a two-volume history of African Americans that appeared in 1882. Black Reconstruction in America by W.B. Du Bois, which appeared in 1935, challenged Dunning's assumptions and conclusions. Both presented fully the role of African Americans in Reconstruction and pointed to the accomplishments of Republican state gov uh, Reconstruction, excuse me, state governments and Black leaders. Beginning in the 1940s and continuing into the 1960s, as the racial attitudes of many white Americans were challenged and often changed by the civil rights movement, white historians increasingly questioned Dunning's views and began to give more attention to the perspectives of the African Americans who had taken part in Reconstruction. Historians today recognize that Reconstruction produced significant changes in Southern life and in the life of the nation, and that Reconstruction collapsed partly because of internal flaws, partly because of divisions within the Republican Party, and partly because of the political terrorism unleashed in the South and the refusal of the North to commit the force required to protect the constitutional rights of African Americans. Individual Voices, Congressman Joseph Rainey from a speech supporting the Ku Klux Klan Act. 
In the House of Representatives, Joseph Rainey was a consistent defender of African Americans and a strong proponent of federal protection for all those Southerners who were attacked because they were Republicans. These are excerpts from his speech in support of the Ku Klux Klan Act, which, by the way, fought against the KKK. It was not in favor of it, but it fought against it. A remedy is needed to meet the evil now existing in most of the Southern states, but especially in that one which I have the honor to represent in part, the state of South Carolina. The enormity of the crimes constantly perpetrated there finds no parallel in the history of this republic in her very darkest days. The prevailing spirit of the Southron, white Southerner, is either to rule or to ruin. Voters must perforce succumb to their wishes or else risk life itself. Daily reports come to us of men throughout the country being whipped, of schoolhouses for colored children being closed, and of parties being driven from their houses and their families. The law affords no protection for life and property in this country, and the sooner the country knows it and finds a remedy for it, the better it will be. Better a thousand times the rule of the bayonet than the humiliating lash of the Ku Klux and the murderous bullet of the midnight assassin. This protection is equally desired for those loyal whites who are now undergoing persecution simply on account of their activity in carrying out union principles and loyal sentiments in the South. In the dawn of our freedom, our young republic was widely recognized and proudly proclaimed uh, to the world the refuge, the safe asylum of the oppressed of all lands. Shall it be said that at this day, through mere indifference and culpable neglect, this grand boast of ours is to become a mere form of words and utter fraud? I earnestly hope not. And yet if we stand with folded arms and idle hands, while the cries of our oppressed brethren sound in our ears, what will it be but a proof to all men that we are utterly unfit for our glorious mission, unworthy of our noble privileges, as the greatest of republics, the champions of freedom for all men. Summary. At the end of the Civil War, the nation faced difficult choices regarding the restoration of the defeated South and the future of the freed people. Committed to ending slavery, President Lincoln nevertheless chose a lenient approach to restoring states to the Union, partly to persuade Southerners to abandon the Confederacy and to accept emancipation. When Johnson became president after Lincoln was assassinated, he took an even more lenient approach. The end of slavery brought new opportunities for African Americans, whether or not they had been slaves. Taking advantage of the opportunities that freedom opened, they tried to create independent lives for themselves and they developed these social institutions that helped to define Black communities. Because few managed to acquire land of their own, most became either sharecroppers or wage laborers. White Southerners also experienced economic dislocation and many also became sharecroppers. Most white Southerners expected to keep African Americans in a subordinate role and initially used black codes and violence toward that end. In reaction against the black codes and violence, Congress took control of reconstruction and passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the 14th Amendment, and the Reconstruction Acts of 1867. An attempt to remove Johnson from the presidency was unsuccessful. Additional federal reconstruction measures included the 15th Amendment, laws against the Ku Klux Klan, and the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Several of these measures strengthened the federal government at the expense of the states. Enfranchised freedmen, white and black Northerners moved to the South, and some Southern whites created a Southern Republican Party that governed most Southern states for a time. The most lasting contribution of these state governments was the creation of public school systems. Like government officials elsewhere, however, some Southern politicians fell prey to corruption. In the late 1860s, many Southern Democrats chose a new departure. They grudgingly accepted some features of Reconstruction and sought to recapture control of state governments. By the mid-1870s, however, Southern politics turned almost solely on race. The 1876 presidential election was very close and hotly disputed. In the end, Rutherford Hayes took office and ended Reconstruction by ordering the removal of federal troops from the South. Without federal protection for their civil rights, African Americans faced terrorism, violence, and even death if they challenged their subordinate role, such as by trying to vote or hold office. With the end of Reconstruction, the South entered an era of white supremacy in politics and government, the economy, and social relations. <laughs>